to generally see what a student would be seeing. It's also quite useful for teaching. If you switch to student preview, your students don't get confused by having a little panel on the side that they can't see. Um, there's something new in there called date management. So for those of you that use a lot of adaptive release and need to check that their assessments and various other things are set up, date management is a very useful tool where you can list them all so you don't miss out any. Um, we have now enabled something called Video Everywhere. This is um, an ability out of the text editor to just record a quick video that will be stored in your YouTube account associated to your London Met um, IT account, which you would need to request for whatever. Um, there's a new function called delegated grading. Now, this is only for web learn assignments, so people using Turnitin, that won't be there. That tool is, shall we say, not intuitive to set up, but worth the pain if you have a larger module. So if you, if you have five, six people also marking, you can assign um, them to particular students. You then have the ability to reconcile marks, etc. So if anybody wants to use that, um, CELD is also going to provide help sessions where you can go in, or you can just try it out, see whether you get it working. Um, and the thing that we like best this year actually is groups. Anybody who's been using groups, there's a horrible little box where it takes ages to find people. They've replaced that now. This now looks, um, well, actually exactly the same as when you add an extra user to your module. So you can see all of the students. You can then just select multiple. You can search for them. So that's nice for a change. We have put the information into the help guides, which we generally find that people haven't even seen. Um, just show you where you can find it on the system. So if you go to help, I'll tap up here. At the moment, they're getting started. We might change that. And there's information about all the things that are new for this year. So for the student <laughs> preview, um, when you go to your module, you see this little eye here. You click on it, and you see it as a student does. Um, in this module, we have just general info. Well, it's an organization. But this is where you find the web learn help that we provide. As per usual, we had issues with the previous system. It's a new version. There'll be some different issues. The ones that we already know about it, uh, are in here. What we really would like you to do is if you have an issue with WebLearn, if you can just email the ICT service so that we can look at it. What we find of people have an issue, they discuss it with a couple of colleagues. We never hear about it. Sometimes there's a solution, sometimes there isn't. But at least we can list it so other staff can easily find it. Um, do you want to have a look at a couple of those new functions, or are you happy to just go and explore? Yeah. We're using a, well, I'm just using a magic quickly. Um, so the student preview is just this button here. It takes a tiny amount of time to start up, uh, because it essentially creates a new user that you won't ever see. But now you can see exactly what is set up on the module. If you have anything hidden, those items won't show. That is exactly what your students will see. Um, when you're in student preview, you can also <coughs> access student tools that you can't normally see. So for, for example, if you have my feedback set up, you can now see what a student would currently see. So if you've forgotten to hide a grade center column or something, quick way of checking it. When you exit the preview, um, you get this question here, and you don't really need to worry about it. The um, keep the preview date, user and all data. If you've used the preview to, I don't know, set, set something up in a journal, enter a couple of um, comments in a variety of places, and you want to look back at that later on, you just keep it. Otherwise, just leave it on the default setting, and that's fine. So just leave it to So when you do it, it does take a few seconds. Don't be too impatient and go like it's already broken, but once you're in it, it works really well. I'm just going to show you date management quickly. So once you've used date management, um, you'll be getting a list of all of your adaptive functions on here. So for example, here there's a couple of announcements. They start on that particular date. If you want to change it, you can edit it from here. 
Now, financial results are very important, but if you have just over a module and you have, I don't know, 20 different hidden items in there, you can check them. The only one thing that we would ask for this tool, I'm just going to go to the starting point, there are a couple of other options in here, um, like module, start, date, um, shift, shift all your dates. You can use that, but it's extremely unlikely to get you the results that you want. It's just going to shift the dates forward. It's not going to take care of bank holidays, um, reading weeks, any of the other times. If you do choose to use it, you still need to review them afterwards and post possibly manually adapt a lot of them. So what we would recommend is just use this last option here. You can see all of your dates. You know whether you're ready for next year. So if you want to add users to a group, instead of having that little box, you get exactly the same view as you would um, for the adding staff users or students to your module. This only has a few users in there. If there's a list of 200, you can actually see all 200 and then select the ones that you want. You can find the user on there. So this is a real improvement for anyone who has to use groups. The video everywhere might be quite useful. And actually, video everywhere, all that you will have to do in every, every single place in the text editor, you will now see this little icon here. When you click on that, um, you can record a video if, and there's a big if, you will need to have a webcam and a microphone. They're not provided by the university. So if, if the faculty might be providing some to their staff, um, it's probably not the best thing to say, but you're probably best doing that from home on your laptop. It's also quieter than the office trying to record it. What you would also need to do is request a Google Apps account if you haven't got one yet. Any member of staff can have a Google Apps account, but they need to email the ICT service desk just requesting the Google Apps account. You'll get something back saying like, oh yes, do you agree with the terms and conditions? And then they enable it for all of the Google Apps. So there's, there's a whole bunch of other things, it includes Google Plus, it includes Blogger, things like that. So it can be quite useful to have in the app. Once you have that and you've got your good um, web camera set up, when you click on that, it'll just come up and you can record and you can go. So it is quite easy. Um, there are a few guidelines on how to use it. Because it adds it to your private Google accounts, your private YouTube account that you would have had to set up, um, it is not the best place to put anything confidential. So if, if you just wanted to record a feedback for one particular student, you would have to fiddle around with so many security settings, most of which don't actually work terribly well. So what we would say for this is use it for anything for the current cohort for this year. If you want to give an introduction about, um, oh, this is what we'll be doing for, for the next couple of weeks or for this topic, go off and do that. The kind of things where you just quickly want to chat rather than developing a real learning resource. If you do that, they probably want to go onto the media server, which we suppose you have. Um, so those are the new functions that we have for this year. We've tested them, they're working. Um, does the video capture all the images of work or do you also have the screen? It's, um, this, this one is only for web <coughs> Yeah. Is there a benefit for the screen? Because we are required to um, You will need to ask learning. Ollie Holmes. Pardon? You will need to ask Ollie Holmes. This is an, I, I don't, Ollie Holmes. Holmes. Um, there is something called Kim Taylor Studio that's supposedly going to be on all teaching machines. But we were told that it, it, it is not the full version, so it does not function properly. It depends on what you mean with a full version. As I said, I'm not actually involved with that. Um, it does come with editing functionality, so whilst you can cut off bits at the front and at the back, if you just want to cut out those five minutes in between, you would need to get some other editing software. Um, it will be available on teaching machines. That I'm just telling you what I've been told, so I don't know where this actually is. 
and eventually you'll be able to download it from London Net apps onto your teaching machine so you can just do a quick recording yourself. But I don't know whether that is there. What is a teaching machine? This is called a teaching machine. As in the ones that are in apps, they, they should all be pre-installed. But I have checked a couple and I haven't seen it yet, so I assume this is still... You mean our desktop? No, I mean, I mean the machines that you have in the lecture theatre that you use to do the presentations, they're, oh, they're usually called teaching machines. Oh, I see. On your desktop, you'll be able to download it yourself from London Met Apps, which yeah. is where you can get all of those. Yeah, yeah. But I don't think it's in there yet. So, sorry, I don't have any more information about okay. that. So these are just general new things. Some of the bits that we need to talk about today are all the changes that are happening with online submission. Um, for this year, um, we, we've had a couple of pilots last year. Um, one of the things that really came out is that students are confused of where they find their online assessment. Um, each faculty has slightly different ways of doing it. Sometimes even within the faculty, people can be using different tabs. So one of the things that students have complained about is it's a little hard to find. The same goes for support staff. If we get a call from students, for example, saying, where's my assessment? I can't assign, but I can't submit. We need to be able to, where, to know where to find it. So every module now has a content area in it that's called online assessment. Um, any of you who've already requested your new modules, you should be seeing it at the top of your module. Has anybody seen it yet? Yay. Two. Okay. <laughs> um, <coughs> this first bit here, staff info, that's hidden from student view. They won't be seeing it. This is just information for you. And one of the things that we've added in there is <coughs> a guide with the current recommendations and guidelines that we have. So what we ask is just leave it sitting there. It, students won't see it, but that is your leave to find the information of what you currently need to do. Um, we have added a link here called My Feedback. That tool was previously called My Grades, but we don't want students to start, start thinking this is about grades. This is about feedback. You might also see your provisional marks. Again, we've put that right in here. We put a note in here saying any mark that you can see on web learning is only provisional and that needs to be stressed to students because some of them still don't, well actually in your area they probably do know by now, other areas not yet. So students will be told that if there is any feedback available, click here. If you see feedback, it is available. If, it's, if you don't see anything, it hasn't been set available yet by your lecturer. Um, again, it makes access for students easier. We've also copied in some submission guidelines because what we found last year, whilst quite a few people did online submission, they didn't provide any particular guidelines for students. Now, some of them would have put it in a different place, some of them would have done it in lectures in various other places, but students didn't always quite know what they have to do and what their responsibility is. We've copied in some guidelines. We ask that people don't remove them. Um, but if you have faculty guidelines and you want to adjust them, change the wording, that's absolutely fine, as long as there are some guidelines for students. The one thing that we would ask you to not remove is the link to the online submission help for students, because that's where students will get all of the information that they require if they want to test submit something and there isn't something on their module, um, what happens if they have a problem. So we'll be providing all of that information. Um, saying that, whilst we're working on it, that's not quite ready yet. So we're hoping to have all of that ready and out there by the 22nd for students. Start this year a little bit earlier. So the idea with this online assessment area is any time you do summative assessment or contributory, whichever term you choose, that needs to go on there. So if you have your coursework one, and you set up an on-time assignment and a late assignment, they should both go on there. The student, when, when they're told to submit online, will be told that is where you find your online assessment. If it's there, great. If it's not there, then people need to start inquiring of what's actually going on. Um, are, have all of you done online assessment last year? Yeah, I think so. One of the things, that we really, really need for online assessment is a naming convention. Um, 
this is the convention that's been agreed with registry and a couple of other areas in the university. The reason why we need a naming convention is otherwise we can't link it up to your assessment components. So whilst you might be doing online submission, um, if it's called my beautiful coursework, that could be any which one of three. So all that we're asking is that people start their assessment with that people start their assessment with a component number as it shows in your vision. So if you're doing an assessment that's for component 002, it will just be 002. And quite frankly, after that, you can give it any name that's suitable for your teaching. So we, we don't care what it's called afterwards as long as it starts with a 002. Then we can link it up. The reason why we would want to link these things up is um, for support. It's so that we can start getting submission data out of the system and provide it to registry. Um, if we definitely know that you're using a particular piece of coursework, we can start providing um, information on which students are late, which ones have missed the deadlines, etc. If we can't link it up to six, then you know we can't provide that information. One of the other reasons why we really need to ask you to use online assessment to deploy all of your assessments is that's what students will be taught. If a student arrives at a hub or wherever else they might arrive, arrive who's not their lecturer and ask about their online assessment, they will be told it should be on this particular location in your module. If it's not there, something's gone wrong, we don't know what it is, we can't find out, we might not get hold of the lecturer, so you need to go and submit in person. So that's the advice that will be given to students. We will be providing some reports out of this. Again, every piece of coursework that has been deployed on that particular area, we will list so that people who need to have an overview of what's available can actually see this. This is mainly for submission data, but also whether assessments are available, whether they are online. Um, slightly later, we will also start providing information for PATs. I don't actually know how that works in your faculty. Is everyone a PAT now, or no? You have just some. Okay. It seems to be working different in every faculty. Um, so, can you ask a question? Have you? Have you it, no, it's called online assessment. Yeah, like and yes, you can go and change it, and then you'll get an email saying like, oh, sorry, there doesn't seem to be any online submission on your system. This student has asked. So yeah, we, anything in the navigation panel, that can't be locked. Anybody can change it, which is why we're asking you to not change yeah, yeah, this one. Yeah. Some of it is policy rather than yeah. And the other thing panel. is, all our forms of assessment should be there as well. They don't need to be there. Yeah, but I always them in one place. If you want them in one that's place, fine. that's fine, but they don't need to be there. So it's um, that that is a choice. The only thing that we're stipulating is the contributory ones need to be there. There's um anyway, so assuming you've managed to set up all of your assessments nicely with the um, component number to start the name of the assessment. Um, everything is going as well, your students are now submitting. One of the ways that we get students, well, we're kind of recreating the way that, that they get a receipt. So for both WebLearn and Turnitin, we can now create digital receipts. A student who submits, either on WebLearn or on Turnitin, will get an email saying, yes, you have submitted. Um, in the student instructions, we will ask students, well, we will tell students that it is their responsibility to download the digital receipt and keep it until they get their final mark. This is basically if a student, if there's, for any reason, um, a student has submitted something, it can't be seen, or something has gone wrong, they have proved that they have submitted. And then from there, we can start investigating what might have gone wrong. Um, just a couple of, actually for the web loan receipts, I've just taken a screenshot of the email. It, it is something that we get off Blackboard. We can't really change a lot of the wording in there. It sounds very technical, including recorded on your server. Um, but it tells students you have submitted. Now, they will get this for every piece of coursework that they submit. So if they submit 12 different things, performative things, they'll also get receipts for this. But <coughs> We'll, we'll explain that to students. 
Um, turnip in receipts look a little bit nicer. Um, but anyway, this is what we will be stressing to students. That is your proof of submission at the end of the day. If you don't have it, then you probably haven't submitted. We also have ways of checking these things out on servers, but. And the submit also this is why you need to set up something called the late assignment. So, we back to the name information. So, in the instructions that we've provided for this year, I'll bring them up in a second if you haven't seen them yet. Um, what we're asking is that for every piece of coursework, you set up a on-time assignment, maybe not the best naming, but that's what we're calling it these days, and the late assignment. The reason for that is if you um, just set up one assignment and wait for everybody to submit on there, you can't really release feedback within the 50 working days, etc. Um, with late assignments, people can be up till three weeks late before they even start them. Yeah, the, the late assignment word you are using is actually for the students who have extension in their assignments. Yeah. You're not actually creating an assignment for everyone for late, it's only specific students. How you do it, that's, that, that's your choice. What we're asking is that there is an on-time assessment that closes when the deadline is done. Sorry, would that be just 003, 003 final word? The one with the L? Yeah. yeah. And the, the late one? That is the, the, that's the for yes. extended deadline. Yeah, the one with the L is for people on the moon. I know. It's an I know but they can't because you can actually personalize the assignment. Well, can we just take a step back? Yeah. 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 Ye
we will provide some information, assuming you've used the naming conventions, of which ones of your students have submitted and, with, and what their deadline was. So you, you can, have you seen the deadline tool, the extended deadline tool that is in WebLearn at the moment? None of you? Hmm. Um, does anybody want to volunteer one of their last year's modules, somebody who had some extensions? Is there any way to stop having Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, if you set the settings that in the instructions um, on, on how to set up things online, it is specified that um, you should be setting it up for one time submission only. You can set that yeah, up. They set it up they submit on time and late. They decide, oh, I want to tweak it a bit and then I'll submit it again. No, but at that, that point, you need to um, figure out as a faculty how you're dealing with that. Um, the recommendation there is the first submission of the student is the submission that counts. So if, if a student just goes like, oh, I'll stick one in in case I don't finish it. Oh, but now I have a better one. I'll try it there. And this is what students need to be told as well. Your first submission is the thing that you have submitted. That's the same as at the assessment office at the moment. Once a student submits a piece of coursework, in theory, they cannot resubmit. Let's be realistic, there are always some exceptions, but quite frankly, I don't know how it's handled in each faculty. Sorry, um, can we just have that module made again? PC 5000. PC. 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 Yeah, politically correct. 5000 entries. <laughs> <laughs> module tools, there's something called extended deadlines, which will list all of the students on your module that have an extended deadline. The same way um, that this is currently listing the students that have a deadline, um, in a few weeks, hopefully, fingers crossed, we will be having a similar report in there that shows you which students have submitted prior to their deadline and which ones are still outstanding. It will also show you which assessment they have submitted to. So that only works on modules. Um, that's only on a per module basis. If you have a cross-listed module, it will show students from either which ones of the things that are linked together. So we still have a few people that have a module that, I don't know, what are they, AS4001, BS4001, they're all linked together. You'll all see that in there. So this tool is going to be extended to allow you to deal better with the late assessments to find out where your students are. Um, again, that will only work if you actually give it the, zero, the name convention 001002, because otherwise we can't link the student's deadline to what they've done in that line. Can you show us where we would do this name convention? This one is just under your module tools called extended deadlines. No, I meant when you're asking us to name it. Where would you name when, it? when you set up your assignment. No, but the, 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 the I do on it says 001 and 002. Isn't it the component? That is just the component <coughs> number that you'll see on your screen. Um, in the instructions that we're putting together, you, you'll have all of that information. Um, so even people using Turnitin need to do it? Yep. Okay. This is, we don't care how you submit online, we care that you use the naming convention. Um, turn it in, you can also give it that number. It's a course. You can. Yeah, but turn it in is kind of not no, no, linked you need to it. Well, how do you get to turn it in? Yes, but last year when, when we did the turn it in, nothing was linked to web learning. But how do you get to turn it in? No, I mean, get nothing was linked in terms of e vision and grades and this, that, and the other. I had to yeah. do all the sorting and figuring everything out yeah. for myself. So. Well, apart from this information was available last year, but yes, the grades, I mean, and this is one of the things. Um, we went through the modules. We have asked people last year to use that convention. Um, I think about 5% managed. I mean, it's not that hard. It's just a couple of numbers. Just yeah, but we weren't there. told that in the training sessions. So yeah. I went to that so We can only post information in a variety of places. But don't you think that this is actually the work that the undergraduate office has been doing and this is now being yeah. pushed over to the... I don't think this is something academic. that I can answer and um, you would need to discuss that with the undergraduate office. But it, it's as simple as that. I can't answer that question. Well, I've discussed that. I, I gave a presentation and 
I uh, make that a topic saying that this is not really an academic task. Mm -hmm. And the undergraduate office has been doing that quite happily and quite efficiently. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, has everybody seen this particular document that you can view? Um, this, is, this is what's available as staff guidelines at the moment. It explains about the um, online submission. It explains about what your grade center would look like this year. And for anybody who hasn't requested their modules yet, we don't copy the grade center over anymore because uh, for some people it just ended up with 400 rows of tests. Um, this means that if you have used any, are any of you using tests? If you've used tests, um, you will need to redeploy them. The test is still in the module. All you have to do is redeploy it with the new date. You would have had to do that anyway. Um, Webland assignments will be deleted. <coughs> One thing for anybody who's been using Turnitin, Turnitin assignments from last year will appear to be copied over into this year's module. It's just the way it works. We can't change that on the system. But you need to just delete them and set up the new ones. If you click on it, it just says like, hey, this one isn't actually working. It would be nice if they didn't copy over the link, but it's there. Um, and then your grade center should look like this. You only see um, five columns. We removed the total column because that is one of those places that people generally didn't find. They thought they hidden everything away, and all of a sudden there's some provisional marks coming through in the total column um, that caused quite a bit of confusion. So, Assuming you don't change the settings that we've put in there, your total column is hidden. Um, when you are creating assignments, are, are you, how many of you have been creating assignments last year? How many of you have been hiding their grade center columns? Yeah, yeah slightly less. <laughs> um, so that won't cause loads of problems, that total one. Yeah. yeah. We've hidden it unless you go and re-enable it. If you set up an assignment online and you don't head hide the grade center column, your students can see the feedback um, before you release it. If you put it, so if you're having your three weeks for marking, you've got some students done, some students you're still working on. When the grade center column is visible, students can actually see that information. So what we recommend is when you set up an assignment afterwards pop to the grade center type the column when you're ready with your feedback when you're ready to release it go back to the grade center just set it available for student view and that's it uh, your stuff is hidden you don't have to worry about it but the easiest way of doing it and keeping on top of it is just every time you set up an assignment just go and hide the grade center column then do it later in this document we have some particular things which is currently called online submission essentials for teaching staff. The things in here are really things that um, you need to be aware of and that you need to be doing. One general thing is any submission that's later than 3.15 will be regarded as late. So um, when assessment data eventually, it's not quite there yet, but when it eventually makes its way to registry and um, students have submitted it 12 at 8 o'clock in the evening, whatever, it will be regarded as late. So make sure that you set it to 3 o'clock with a gap till 3.15 for any problems. Don't tell students about that gap. Tell them it's 3, but make it 3.15. And um, that should be fine. There's one other thing in there that people need to know this year. This is mainly for people that are using Turnitin. Turnitin has a concept that's um, well, it's called the class expiry day. When a module is created, each module on WebLearn creates a class on Turnitin, which is an external system that we're just linking to. Um, this class has an, has an expiry day, and the default is six months. So if you go in on the first, or even before you start teaching, and you set up every single assignment for the entire year that you'll be using it, um, by the time you get round to your third assignment, those six months are probably up. What we recommend to do is set your turn in assignments up about, I don't know, a, a month, two weeks before you actually need to set it live. Um, every time you set up a new assignment, um, that expiration date gets expanded. So it, it's not something that has hit many people, 
Um, we've, we've been running with this for the last year and we don't have any classes that did expire before the teaching was completed. By the way, expired class simply means that people can't submit to it anymore. You can't make any more changes. All your data is there, all your student information is there, but um, you can't um, do any, any further grading in your first grade. So what we would recommend is set your assignment up shortly before you start to run the assignment for students, you'll be fine. If there is a problem, email to ICT service desk, we can ask Turnitin itself to re-enable it. So it's not a big drama, but it's a hassle if it happens. Um, there is one other thing which is about when assessments need to go live to students. We've had a few phone calls last year of students saying, I've been trying to submit online for ages and I can't find it. And they've only been set live to students a day before the actual submission day. So what we've agreed is that two weeks prior to actual submission, students should be able to start submitting online. Um, that's roughly what they can currently do at registry, where if they hand it in, then that's going to be their hubs. Um, they, they can't come four weeks, uh, sorry, four months before and say, I've already done that assignment, but they can go there two weeks prior to the assessment. So, two weeks prior to the actual deadline, the base deadline for the module, make it available for students. So, so where, where can you find this document? Is there no uh, help tab? No? When you request your module, um, any, any module, right. all of them will have this online assessment area copied in. First link there, we stuck in some information to start. If you click on it, that takes you to this document. And we'll be updating this document regularly as well. There is also something, and we recommend that people add themselves to it. We have an organization called Online Submission Staff Guidelines. And you can self-enroll on there by using a self-enrollment password, which is currently online 14 pilot. Might change at some point, but for the time being, that's the password. You can find that information in a document. That organization is going to be updated with all of the information that we have. Um, any changes will also go into that organization. It's a slightly easier way than going to find that word document back. Once you add yourself, you just have access to it. Um, we're happy to add a whole faculty in one fell swoop if people don't want to do it individually, but generally we don't tend to add large numbers of staff on an organization because, you know, there's too many of those things. So, do you have any specific questions to online submission right now? Yeah. Um, for this year, we've been asked to disable anonymous marking. The reason for that is on Turnitin, it's truly anonymous, so anonymous that nobody can tell whether the student has submitted or not. There have been some problems with that last year. Turnitin is, Turnitin is actually changing their whole system next year where what we're getting is going to, it's, it's going to be fairly similar to what we have, but they're providing new technology where we will be able to get that submission data. At the moment, we can't. As an institution, Turnitin is fairly blind to us. We can't go in and check how the students submitted in an English form across the faculty or the institution. So because of that, for Turnitin, there isn't any anonymous marking this year. Otherwise, we'd have students that can't prove that they have submitted for about three weeks. Students who have missed their submission or something has gone wrong. Um, we've had students last year who thought they'd submitted, but they didn't click that last button. So they're, they're kind of sitting back going like, yes, I've done some great work, I have submitted it. And then they hear four weeks later that nobody can find their assessment. So that's the reason why. Hopefully it's back next year. If you require anonymous marking for this year, you can do it um, using web learn assignments. The drawback of that is you can't use the Turnitin grade mark tool. Um, so if, if you've been using grade mark and the um, originality reports, you won't have that with the web learn assignments. Um, what progress has been made in terms of um, transporting grades directly from web learn to the position? We tell you as soon as you use the menu convention. Without that, we mm -hmm. can't do it. It as simple as that. So, so if we use the menu convention, then that will happen automatically. 
towards the end of the year, yes, when when your subject standard board happens. So if you have a sem semester one module, mm -hmm. that's a different timeline than for a semester, so for a year long one. That's what we're working on. Um, at the moment, people are, not people in faculties, but people in registry are a lot more interested in submission data rather than the actual marks. Um, we're trying to lump them all together mm -hmm. so we can get that out. I know, it's not fun. Have to uh, do a grouping by uh, timetable in WebLearn. You know how we've got large modules and we have more than eight. We, we don't have that ability at the moment. Not sure. No, but what we were thinking is putting in a change request with Blackboard, the company that provides WebLearn. Um, the previous system that we had actually did have the ability, we haven't used it, but it did have that ability. So we're going to ask whether we can have something similar back and then look at it. But we only have X amount of staff. I know it's the same everywhere. And at the moment, we're prioritizing things. So the things that we're prioritizing is getting the submission data and providing something for marks. That makes it easier. I can tell you what we're planning. Um, I can't make you guarantees that it's going to be there. The way that it would be working is, because we can't just go in and fetch marks at a particular day. If somebody hasn't finished their grading after three weeks, there's many reasons why that can't happen. We don't want to go in, fetch marks, and go like, oh, well, the other ones aren't there. So we will need to set something up where a lecturer, once they have completed all of their things, um, goes and presses a button and says, this one's ready for transfer. Um, it will then involve, it still will involve a fair amount of checking. Um, one, one person from this faculty has tried a very early version of that. All that happens is that your marks will go into the mark entry screen on eVision. You'd still need to confirm that this looks okay to you. You still need to press the calculate button. Does that make sense? So, it's about uh, again naming the coursework in WebLearn. What I have is a one coursework on eVision, but that coursework has six different components in the WebLearn. You'll be getting an email from registry. Um, people have been asked this year. I don't know where that is at the moment. That should have gone out to some levels of faculty management by now. Anybody who has a portfolio type coursework or anything that has six different points in time, it doesn't matter if you have six different files at the same time, that's fine, not a problem. If you have six different times, you'll be asked to set up six assessment components for it. Um, the reason for that is if a student comes back and says, well, you know, I'm, submit, I'm supposed to submit all six of those, but um, I've done five and not this one, but I needed mitigating circumstances for that. How can anybody attach mitigating circumstances for a date that doesn't exist anywhere? So... From the e-vision, we need to put six different components. That's what had been discussed, and this, as far as I know, this is an email that should have gone out to some more, some faculty management levels. And um, have you, the make this year, the, the module assessment information gathering um, should be bringing out some of those things this year. So when that email comes out, they're trying to do it earlier. There's no point doing information, uh, sorry, assessment information gathering in week seven when some people have already done assessment. So hopefully this is going to come out to, well, before the end of September, but like that, at which point you should also receive that information. Okay. Last year, um, it uh, turned out that the um, settings that uh, I chose for the plagiarism score or originality score were very unstable. So sometimes the, with, for some students the references were included and for others they, were, they weren't. Has, has, do yeah. you have any info whether the supplier of WebLearn yeah. has done some work to make I mean the interesting thing with that is stable? that doesn't seem to have been a problem for other people. So because we've had a lot of people using it last year's. So we don't quite know what particularly happened in, in your area well, or, or with your assessment. You know, there were yeah. 120 students. Also. So it, it's generally, I mean, what, what we would recommend is before setting up an assessment, um, particularly if it's Turnitin, 
um, to figure out which settings are required and not change them afterwards. That's no, not always. It was just. Yeah, I'm not talking about your particular thing. I'm just yeah. talking about the recommendations generally. It's like if you change settings afterwards, you can do it. That's sometimes you'll just have to do it. But generally, if you can avoid it, it's best to avoid. Well, there can be well, problems. The problem was also that I couldn't change it afterwards. So I I had said exclude the references, yeah. and then it was changed into include the references. Plus, it was grayed out. I couldn't set it back to the original setting. <coughs> yeah. And I'm I'm so put off from this by this that. Uh, I will only use Trident if I have to, not if, if I've got an option, I will avoid it. Yeah. So do this we is something to, for your faculty to, to discuss. Do we have to use Trident or not? This is for your faculty to discuss. I don't know what the regulations oh, you are know. in oh. your faculty right now. Okay. Different faculties do different things this yeah. year. Yeah. But whatever your faculty has decided needs to happen okay. is... Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we okay. have... Oh there. yeah, we follow our duties. Um, there, there can be problems um, with well, with any technology. It's like you know, it's really realistic. Generally, it works quite well. The issues that we had last year with online submission mm, were more likely to be around procedure of how it's been set up, of um, what students have been told or not told. Then it had to do with actual technical issues. There have been some. Um, all that we can say that if you are experiencing a technical issue, particularly with Turnitin, um, is contact us as soon as possible so we can log it with the supplier and find out what it is. Turnitin last year um, has been fairly stable, but there was a little drama around the Christmas time, um, which luckily we didn't have deadlines at that particular time, but a lot of other universities had, and it wasn't available for a few days. So one thing anybody who does online submission would need to be aware that if there are problems, we need to find a way of dealing with that. If it is a wide system issue, um, then deadlines are automatically extended. So for example, if we find out that there was an issue with Turnitin or WebLearn, and occasionally even the library, that gets a day extension um, to students. This is going to be interesting when these things start happening, but that's another one where, yes, all of a sudden you might find a lot more <coughs> submissions in your late assessment than in the on-time one. Um, one of the things that we've heard from quite a few other universities by now, students that start with online submission, you get a lot of the dog ate my homework excuses with which usually go along the lines of the system wasn't working. We have audit trails. We can tell whether a student has logged in at that time. We can tell whether they were on the module. And these audit trails, I mean, this is kind of, that's Blackboard's business. They really are quite strong on those. If the student doesn't show up in the audit trail but claims they have tried to submit, we can rule that out. Usually that takes a year or two um, to settle down in some areas. But if there are complaints like that, then again, it needs to be logged and it needs to be looked at. Is there anything particular you want to know this You're all happy to go and do online submission now? Yeah, can I just clarify that one? Yeah. So if a student claims that they handed in late because they tried to submit and couldn't, when they put in for mitigation that it goes to systems to check and someone will report back to say, no, that student was not logged on the system, so this is invalid. For, yeah. if, if it goes by casework, yes. Yeah. They, they will contact work. us, and we can yeah. provide all the things. Actually, okay, we're going to get them out. That's, that's fine. I just wanted to be sure yeah. that, that that's what's going to happen, rather than that we have to yeah. start to ask you to do that to report. Okay. Yeah, no, it should go through casework. I mean, there are things where students go like, oh, but my internet wasn't working. Well, yeah. at that point, you need to figure out how you're dealing with that as a faculty. Mm -hmm. And it's probably quite good if, as a faculty, you had an idea of what is acceptable and what isn't. It's if a student tries to submit five minutes before and then finds that their computer crashes. Is that a late submission? Is that not? Give it up to you. Are you in the student have students can access their feedback via That will be included, yes. Base, basically, oh sorry, one, one other thing. Um, students will be able to access every type of feedback through that My Feedback link. 
um, whilst you can go direct into Turnitin, the assignment, and then look, you can click a couple of buttons. Um, so you can click on my feedback, and it will also list your Turnitin assignments. And what we're going to recommend to students is use that one. doesn't mean that they can't use the other one, but we don't want to give 50 different ways of how to find it. We're just going to say, this is the way that we're telling you. If you find another one, great. Sorry, what I meant was, because I've used Turnitin this year, and I've put feedback on there's a couple of short videos explaining which one is what, also with the originality report of what they can see there. Um, then yes, I'm, I'm ticking, for, for example, if you use the spell checker, which is kind of like word spell checker, it might be appropriate in some cases, in others it's not. Yes, there will be explanations for that. And if anybody would right, volunteer to proofread. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, that's that's the idea. But if anybody wants to volunteer to proofread and give us feedback on those things, that would be extremely welcome because at the moment we're just putting it together. There we go, got one volunteer. A second? No? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs>